This is Forgotten Wars. After the conclusion of Black Week, after Buller suffered defeat at Colenso, General Buller swirled with frustration. Buller telegrammed Lansdowne that his army corps at Colenso, quote, ought to let Lady Smith go and occupy good positions for the defense of South Natal and let time help us, end quote. Buller claimed afterwards, with credibility, that he did not mean he wanted to let Lady Smith fall to the Boers when he said, let go. Buller then telegrammed a suggestion to Lieutenant General White that you heard last week. I tried Colenso yesterday, but failed. The enemy is too strong for my force, except with siege operations, which will take one full month to prepare. Can you last so long? Stop. If not, How many days can you give me to take up defensive position, after which I suggest you firing away as much ammunition as you can and making the best terms you can? Stop. I can remain here if you have alternate suggestions, but unaided, I cannot break in. Pakenham writes, quote, If only Buller could have expressed himself more plainly and less bluntly. All that Pakenham claims Buller wanted was to revert back to his original plan, to take pressure off of Ladysmith by attacking Boers further west. Pakenham picks up again, quote, The main question then, in mid-December, was how long could he, General White, hold out? The other question was, could he cut his way out? Talk of surrender was premature, as well as tactless. For this error, too, Buller was made to pay the price though the cable was to have absolutely no effect on the campaign, end quote. Despite suffering a serious reverse at Colenso, the Army Corps' morale rebounded. Why? Buller. He visited the survivors of the abandoned artillery pieces and personally thanked them for their courage. Buller gained credibility and respect from his men in defeat. Respect that many generals don't earn from their men in victory. After getting his anger off his chest via telegram, Buller planned for another way to relieve Lady Smith and wrote more philosophically to his wife. But then, a message, a telegram, arrived from London. Buller would no longer keep his command of all operations in South Africa. Buller instead would be relegated to command over operations in Natal. The man who would take Buller's place was not who Buller expected. Buller's commander-in-chief of the British Army, Lord Wolseley. No, the man who would take Buller's place was Lansdowne's personal friend from his days in India and the receiver of another blunt message from Buller. This message read simply, Your gallant son died today. Condolences, Buller. As some of you already know, that man who would take Buller's place was none other than that grieved and angry father of Lieutenant Freddie Roberts, Field Marshal Lord Roberts. Under the British flag, you will have everything you desire, but that flag will continue to fly over the land. Over the land, maybe. Over the people, never. You will see me in the field, fighting for our independence, long after you and your party who make war with your mouths have fled the country. I don't think the Boers will have a chance. Disarm your blacks. Act the part of a white man in a white man's war. Civilized war is awful. Now, lest you think that Buller's command fell into Lord Roberts's lap, know that Roberts had been lobbying for this position since 1896, and even as recently as just days before Colenso. Roberts and Lansdowne took advantage of Buller's angry telegrams to convince British cabinet that Roberts should have Buller's job. Wolseley must have felt mixed about the news coming from South Africa. He, like much of the British public, 
was upset to hear of what British forces suffered during Black Week. But Wolseley finally saw British cabinet take his calls for more army funding seriously. Cabinet even decided to accept civilian volunteers, thousands of the new Imperial Yeomanry, thousands of hunting and shooting mounted men that didn't have Wolseley's desired military discipline. When Wolseley complained to Lansdowne about how these mounted men lacked military discipline, Lansdowne replied, quote, The Boers are not, I suppose, very highly drilled or disciplined. End quote. Before 1899's end, 20,000 more regular troops and 20,000 more volunteers set sail for South Africa. Before we go back to South Africa's scene, there is a ripple that helped feed into a world war that you should know about. Sir Alfred Milner convinced the British to have their navy search foreign ships believed to be carrying war material to the Transvaal or Orange Free State. So in December, the German passenger ship Bundesrat was stopped and forced into port and searched. The British Navy found nothing. Then the British stopped the German passenger ship, the Herzog, and searched it and found nothing. Then the British Navy took another swing and missed when they stopped and searched a third German passenger ship and found nothing. These searches could not have come at a better time for the German government. These British blows to German honor helped an existing bill to sail through the Reichstag. The bill would dramatically increase the size of the German Navy in 1900. This would not be the last arms race in Europe before World War I by a long shot. Back in South Africa, President Creer and President Stain wanted more decisive, offensive action out of its commanders, especially in the Cape Colony. But they would not sack Piet Cronier in favor of Christian de Vette or Cus de la Rey. Soon, Creer and Stain wouldn't have a choice. On the other hand, Major General French had only mixed success attacking Commandant Hendrik Schumann's Boers in the Cape Midlands. And ultimately, French's force suffered disproportionately heavy losses for no significant geographical gain. But on January 6th, on the calendar day of my birth, on the Eastern Front, the Boers made their most serious attack. Some would even say their only serious attack on British forces defending Ladysmith. On January 3rd, Commandant General Pete Yobert led a Craig's Rod where they decided to attack Observation Hill, north of Ladysmith, while launching the main attack on Platrant, south of Ladysmith. These clashes are known collectively as the Battle of Platrant. This time, it was the Boers who failed in an attack. Both Boer attack forces thinned out before reaching their targets, before the British even fired on them. General C.J. de Filiers, who stormed Machuba during the First Boer War, bravely led one of the Boer attack forces. Winston Churchill woke up 18 miles away to the sounds of the Boers bombarding British positions in the Battle of Platrant. These Boer attacks ultimately failed. The British either checked the attacks or reversed attacks that enjoyed short-term success. The Boers tried from before dawn until after sunset to take Observation Hill and Wagon Hill. They took Wagon Hill only to have to abandon it after a heavy British reinforcement stormed the hill. General de Filiers was the last war to leave Wagon Hill. Major General Ian Hamilton managed most of the defense, but the bumbling General White intervened at the last minute, demanding the British charge the Boer positions before darkness fell that January 6th, even though it was well known that the Boers would likely abandon their positions anyway. The Battle of Platrant cost the British 150 men killed and 275 men wounded. Nearly 30 more of those wounded died afterwards. The Boers lost around 65 killed and 125 wounded. Colonel Sir Henry Rawlison 
served with Kitchener in Sudan less than two years before when the British killed 15,000 dervishes in battle. But Rawlison felt far more disturbed, for some reason, by the aftermath of Platrant. Rawlison wrote, quote, White corpses are far more repulsive than black. One Captain Stevenson looked at the corpses outside of Lady Smith and wrote in his diary, something you have heard every episode. Civilized war is awful. Just days after the Battle of Platrant, Lord Roberts and his chief of staff, the Spartan, Lord Horatio Herbert Kitchener, landed in Cape Town on January 10th, 1900. Lord Roberts decided to, against Lansdowne's advice, keep Buller in command. We don't know for sure why Roberts kept Buller. What we do know is that Roberts bossed Buller around with a steady stream of cables commanding Buller to remain on the defensive. So Buller listened. Nah, not really. Buller refused to leave his reputation in shambles. Buller opted to hold Buller's in position at Colenso and send British forces to break the war noose around Lady Smith from the west. The main British force of 15,000 men and 36 guns would march 18 miles upstream to Trehart's Drift, then split the hills of Spion Kup and Twin Peaks and outflank the Boers at Tabin Yama Hill. Who would personally lead this force? Lieutenant General Sir Charles Warren, someone Nassen says was notoriously hot-tempered and on bad terms with his commander-in-chief, that commander-in-chief being Buller. Buller then planned to attack Port Heater's Drift with the remainder of his army. Buller believed his task would be more difficult, but his task never came. Warren would do just about everything in those days leading up to Spion Kup, slowly. So slowly that Buller seriously considered replacing Warren. A French lieutenant serving in a French-led force of foreign volunteers wrote this in his book, Ten Months in the Field with the Boers. British officers, he wrote, quote, with some few exceptions, are ignorant of everything an officer should know. The operations of Sir Charles Warren, Lord Methuen, and Sir Redfur's Buller seem to be a sort of competition of lunatics. General Buller appears to have some inkling of it himself. On December 28, he writes as follows from the camp of Frere. I suppose our officers will in time learn the value of scouting. But in spite of all one can say, up to this our men seem to blunder into the midst of the enemy and suffer accordingly. These words from the pen of the general, who on January 24th was to authorize the Spion Kup fiasco, are delicious. End quote. The official date for the Battle of Spion Kup is January 24th. But Franz Johann Praetorius argues that this battle actually started with British forces crossing the Tugela River on January 17th. On January 18th, Colonel Earl of Dundonald's Mounted Brigade surprised 160 Boers at Acton Holmes and exposed how weak the Boer right flank was. Dundonald wanted to keep the initiative and stay on the offensive, but the cranky General Warren would have none of it. Warren instead recalled the cavalry, totally unaware that he was missing an open road to Ladysmith. The British also, again, failed to thoroughly scout the area they were advancing through. Louis Boita took full advantage of this opportunity to reinforce his right flank, while Warren made foolish frontal assaults on well-camouflaged war trenches along the Tabanyama Hills. When Warren and Buller on January 22nd met, they decided they couldn't pass through the Tabanyama Hills without first seizing Spion Kup, the hill overseeing all other mountain ledges for miles around. The Boers themselves knew Spion Kup to be a terrible defensive position and only committed a light contingent to defend it. That night of January 23rd, 
17-year-old Denise Wrights ate dinner and chatted around a fire with some men of his commando. Most of those men around the campfire were dead by the next morning. With a thick mist blurring the hills, Major Edward Woodgate departed with 1700 at 8.30 p.m. from Warren's camp on January 23rd. This would be Major General Woodgate's last battle. At 3 a.m. the next day, the assault force of this 1,700-man contingent reached the final slope leading to the summit of Spion Kop. Major Alexander Thornycroft, a veteran of the Anglo-Zulu War and the First Boer War, led this assault force with fixed bayonets to drive 50 Boers off this hill. Major Thornycroft would be leading a lot more men before the day was over. Major General Woodgate's men then dug a three to four hundred yard trench that faced northwards and curved in on the sides. They slaved over this trench since much of the ground was hard soil and solid rock. When they finished this shallow trench, it provided adequate cover from rifle fire on the forward crest of the summit, or at least where they thought the forward crest of the summit was. Woodgate placed Major Thornycroft's men in the center of these trenches. Unfortunately for the British, Lieutenant General Charles Warren did not bother to plan proper defensive support from afar or decide on easily navigated paths in case of withdrawal. Nassen writes scathingly about this, saying, quote, Such foolhardiness betrayed an almost criminal carelessness towards the lives of his men. End quote. The past six weeks frustrated Louis Boita. He yearned and called for an offensive strategy, but instead had to watch his men do nothing but reduce in number for the four weeks after the Battle of Colenso, leaving all the initiative to Buller and soon Roberts. Due to Skulk Berger and Pete Yobert's mismanagement, Boita had to swallow the war failure to take Ladysmith via Platrant. Now Boita was stuck implementing the defensive blocking strategy he so loathed. He even heard rumors that he would have to give his command back to the sickly General Lucas Mayer. So remember those wars that Thornycroft's men drove off Spion Kop around 3 a.m.? Some of those wars reached General Skulk Berger and Louis Boita. Berger as Jobert's second-in-command nominally outranked Boita, but Boita shaped their battle plans the most. Berger and Boita passed on another stirring telegram from Creer to their officers. These war officers threatened to flog any Boers who did not follow orders and cowered away from driving the British off of Spion Kop. Berger sent Commandant Hendrik Prinzlua to take Spion Kop, with 84 Carolina Burgers. Prinz Lua sent 25 men ahead and then conferred with Buta, who is in overall command. Buta prepared his men to offer rifle fire cover from hills north, northwest, and northeast of Spion Kop, and prepared four guns to support the attack. Buta sent the remaining 60 Carolina Burgers to climb up the goalie between Spion Kop and Alo Knoll. Around 7 a.m., as the morning mist began to clear, Major General Woodgate was horrified to find that the crest of Spion Kup was at least 50 yards away. 50 yards away from where his men had slaved over trenches that only held the summit of Spion Kup. Where they sat, the British would not see oncoming Boers until the last minute. Woodgate immediately tried to fix this by sending some men to occupy Spion's Kop's crest. Just as those men reached the crest, they collided with Prince Lua's 25 Carolina Burgers, sending the Burgers running. But then, the other 60 Carolina Burgers appeared. A fierce fight broke out. Commandant Roy Danielle Operman and others led hundreds more war reinforcements and storming up Spion Kop. Denise Wrights rushed along with these reinforcements. Pakenham writes, quote, Wrights dismounted, 
tied up his horse with the rest, and started to clamber up the slope in search of his comrades. He found them all along the way up the hill. John Malherbe, with a bullet between his eyes. His own tent mate, Robert Reinecke, shot through the head. De Filiers, dead. Jan Smuts's brother-in-law, shot through both lungs, but still alive. And Walter de Foss, another tent mate, hit in the chest, but somehow smiling bravely. End quote. Boers and Brits fired at each other from behind boulders and trenches barely 20 yards apart. Some literally fought hand to hand. Denise Wrights reported that, quote, the English troops lay so near that one could have tossed a biscuit among them. Although the battle remained stationary, the heavy close-range rifle fire continued hour after hour, and the tale of losses mounted while we lay in the blazing heat. Now here is where Wrights gets even more interesting. I saw a strange incident during the morning. Near me was a German named von Brusewitz. He had been an officer in the German army, but the year before he had run a civilian through with his sword during some scuffle in a Berlin cafe. There was a great outcry over the incident, and to allay popular clamor, the German emperor broke him from his regiment. They say that in Germany, the word, and I'll surely butcher this, Brusa Witzere, is still used to denote the arrogance of the officer caste. However that may be, von Brusewitz was now on top of Spion Kopp, where he seemed bent on getting killed, for, although we warned him not to expose himself too recklessly, he paid no heed, and repeatedly stood out from among the rocks to fire. As the English soldiers were so close to us, this was sheer folly, and after he had tempted Providence several times, the inevitable happened. I saw him rise once more, and lighting a cigarette, puff away careless of the flying bullets until we heard a thud, and he fell dead within a few feet of me, shot through the head. End quote. At 8.30 a.m., Vuitta's artillery and rifle fire engulfed British positions, immediately dealing Woodgate a wound, a wound that would ultimately kill him. Then a familiar force overtook the British. Confusion. Confusion over whether Colonel Crofton, Major General Talbot Coke, or Major Thornycroft was in command. Supporting Boer rifle fire and artillery fire raked over the British on Spion Kopp's summit over and over and over again, killing and mutilating many. Buller looked on from his camp at Mount Alice. He was raging with resentment. Buller had to be experiencing deja vu, thinking of the disaster at Colenso a month ago. Pakenham writes, quote, Once again, he thought, trying to suppress his rage at Warren. A good plan had been thrown away by his subordinates. He had been sold by a damned gunner at Colenso. This refers to Colonel Long running artillery pieces way ahead of British troops. Now, Buller, had been sold by a damned sapper. Warren failed to strike at Tabanyama on the 17th when it was almost undefended. Warren had funked attacking it on the 21st when to attack needed courage, yet was practicable. Today, Warren's obstinacy had wrecked Buller's own two-pronged attack. End quote. Major General Littleton had sent two infantry battalions with most of Buller's mounted troops without even consulting Buller. By 1145, roughly 350 Boers drove the Brits off the crest and back into their trenches along Spion Kopp's summit. Wrights reports that some Boers were trickling away from the field. Some Brits surrendered at 1 p.m. Then, British reinforcements braved accurate Boer gun and rifle fire to beef up existing positions on the hills. General Buller ordered Lieutenant General Charles Warren to give Buller command of Spion Kopp's operations. 
Warren didn't bother to pass on this new command arrangement to Major General Talbot Koch. Fierce fighting continued. War correspondents looked on from Mount Alice. One of those correspondents was a journalist and nominal member of the South African Light Horse. He wore a war hat. That journalist, the recently escaped Winston Churchill. Winston had been very depressed as a POW in Praetoria, but he kept his eyes and ears peeled for an opportunity to escape and continued to write to anyone who would listen, demanding his release from Praetoria, denying any role as a combatant, or even any role in trying to get his armored train back on its tracks in Natal. Pete Yobert had eventually ordered Churchill's release, but those orders did not reach Churchill's camp before he forced his way into a couple other men's escape plan. One of those men, the Captain Holdane, who commanded the armored train during their capture. Then, Churchill jumped the gun when he saw an earlier opportunity and made the escape on his own on December 12th. For escaping his POW camp, Churchill won great fame back in England, fame that helped propel him soon after to his first seat in British Parliament. Churchill returned to England with a new appreciation for the plight of any sort of prisoner. When he became British Home Secretary and supervisor of British prisons ten years later, Churchill sought to make life for British prisoners more bearable, making sure that they had access to exercise and books. But now we are getting ahead of ourselves. As Churchill and other correspondents looked on, the King's Royal Rifles, with naval gunfire from Mount Alice, drove boars with their pom-pom and Krupp guns off of Twin Peaks. Ignoring Buita's pleas to hold fast, General Skulk Berger fled from the battle with the pom-pom and Krupp from Twin Peaks, leaving a gaping hole in the Boer line that General Warren could have pushed through to roll up the remaining Boers. This was the start of relieving pressure on beleaguered British defending Spion Kop. Now, the king's royal rifles could focus on driving the Boers off Alo Knoll and really turn the tide in favor of Spion Kop's defenders. But then, irony reared its head again. Pakenham tells us what happens next. Quote, but one man had this power, the power to snatch defeat from the jaws of victory, and that was poor, plotting General Warren. Napoleon once said that victory goes to the general who makes fewest mistakes. In other words, that war is, at bottom, a contest in blunders. The saying has never been illustrated in a more stylized way than in the Battle of Spion Kop. Here were two armies, separated by a gap across which you could have thrown a biscuit as easily as you could have thrown it across a stage. And all the protagonists, all except Buta, stumbled about the stage as though they were blindfolded. End quote. General Warren left Major Thornycroft completely in the dark about who was in charge on Spion Kop, and when Thornycroft could expect relief. Major Thornycroft, his senses beaten to bits by twelve hours of near constant fighting, decided his men couldn't hold their exposed position on Spion Kop another day. Winston Churchill, who couldn't stand by and watch any longer on Mount Alice, delivered a note that General Warren sent far too late. A note that finally promised reinforcements and artillery support. Thornycroft mumbled, Better six good battalions down the hill, than a bloody mop-up in the morning. Major Thornycroft refused to hold out any longer. General Warren's lack of communication left no clear chain of command. So Lieutenant Colonel Hill challenged Thornycroft's authority to withdraw. No troops cared. General Warren's staff officer, Captain Phillips, couldn't stop the withdrawal before it was too late. 
So the British withdrawal from Spion Kup began just as many wars started to disappear off Spion Kup. Shortly before that, after hours of ignoring Major General Littleton's orders to withdraw from their newly won position along Twin Peaks, the King's Royal Rifles finally obeyed inexplicably stupid orders to give up their hard-fought position. Early that next day of January 25th, Louis Boita, with eloquence and threats, rallied some boars back up the abandoned Spion Kup to victory. That day, General Buller withdrew all his troops to the south bank of the Tugela River, failing again to relieve Lady Smith. In the wake of the Battle of Spion Kup, hundreds of dead and wounded lay strewn across the hills, dead, darkened by ants and flies, dead, being ripped apart by hyenas. Mohandas Gandhi and the rest of the Natawo Indian Ambulance Corps worked long and hard on January 25th to rescue the wounded and collect the dead from the battlefield. Nassen quotes another source, writing, Gandhi's volunteers won great admiration from British command for its endurance in dangerous conditions and preparedness to tackle the messy business of seeing to the maimed and the dead, end quote. In the wake of the battle lay 290 dead Brits and Brits who would die from their wounds, with about 560 more Brits wounded and another 300 Brits becoming POWs, so almost 1,200 British casualties in all. A grisly photograph from this battle survives showing hundreds of dead British stacked up in their trenches, some so maimed that they are unrecognizable. The Boers had not even 20% of these casualties, with about 70 killed and 135 wounded. Hendrik Prinz Lua's Carolina Burgers made up a quarter of these casualties. Denise Wrights returned to his tent back at camp. No one was there to greet him. One tentmate lay wounded in a lahar near Spion Kup, while his remaining four tentmates were dead. Despite the Boer victory, Buota's Boers melted away in major numbers after Spion Kup. In the meantime, Buller's cousin, a Times correspondent, wrote home sadly about how everyone was losing their confidence in Buller. Major General Littleton and other officers' whisper campaign against General Redfur's Buller gained momentum, despite their stupidity contributing to Buller's disasters. Nicknames like Sir Reverse Buller or the Ferryman of the Tugela grew stickier. Unfortunately for Buller, he still hadn't suffered his final humiliation. So something you may have noticed is that this episode, had no commercials and no calls for support. If you want the rest of your episodes to be like this, and if you would like to re-listen to episodes without any commercials or calls for support, make a $50 donation via PayPal on our website. You can do this by going to the donate page on your own or by using the link I'll provide here in the show notes. Thanks again for listening.